While President Obama visited Ethiopia Monday, he made a passing reference to press freedom, calling on the Ethiopian government to, quote, open additional space for journalists, for media, for opposition voices. Well, the Committee to Protect Journalists has described Ethiopia as one of the leading jailers of journalists on the continent. At least 11 journalists and bloggers are currently in prison. Six others were released just before Obama's visit. Today, we turn to the remarkable story of two Swedish journalists who traveled to Ethiopia in 2011 to report on the actions of the Swedish oil company London Oil in the Ogaden region, where there's been a fight for independence since the 70s. London Oil is well known in Sweden, in part because one of its past board members is Carl Bildt, Sweden's former prime minister and foreign secretary. Five days after crossing the border from Somalia to Ethiopia, the journalists, Martin Chivier and Johan Persson, were shot and captured by the Ethiopian army. They ended up spending over a year in prison, which they chronicle in their book, 438 Days, How Our Quest to Expose the Dirty Oil Business in the Horn of Africa Got Us Tortured, Sentenced as Terrorists, and Put Away in Ethiopia's Most Infamous Prison. I had a chance to interview Martin Chibier last year in Sweden at the Almadalen Political Festival in Visby, an island uh, off of Sweden. I asked him to describe what happened to him. Well, the short version is I was jailed for, for doing my job um, as a journalist in a country where journalism is criminalized. The, the longer version uh, goes that me and the photographer, Johan Persson, were supposed to investigate a Swedish oil company active in the Ogaden region. And in this oil company, the, the Swedish foreign minister had been on the board. And they were exploring oil in a region which, which is war-torn, in a region where refugees are fleeing uh, in numbers, and in a region where there are reports of gross human rights uh, violations. So there were two sides to this story. The oil company would say that, well, exploring oil will benefit the region. Uh, the refugees were saying, no, the oil companies make the situation worse. And we didn't want to do a, on one hand, on the other hand, in the end time will tell story. We wanted to see for ourselves what is true or not. So, and uh, kind of use our f feet more than Google and uh, wanted to go into this region and see how was the situation there for the civilian population. Especially for an American audience, I don't think the conflict in Ethiopia is uh, very well known. Can you explain what the Ogaden region is? The Ogaden region is in the east of, of Ethiopia, and it's a region inhabited by ethnical uh, Somalis. So it was, it has long time been uh, been debated and fought over between Somalia and Ethiopia, and, and currently the, the region is within the, the borders of, of Ethiopia. Uh, but the, the inhabitants feel colonized. Uh, they feel they they are uh, misrepresented in within the Ethiopian political system. So there is a guerrilla movement uh, fighting for independence attacking foreign oil companies. Uh, but the, and the problem is also that the region is closed. Ethiopia doesn't allow any journalists to enter. The UN are not allowed to enter. The Red Cross has been kicked out. Uh, Doctors Without Borders have been kicked out. So it's an area which is kind of a white area on, on the map. Uh, few reports get out of what is really happening there. So that's why it was, it was crucial as, as a journalist to go there and, and, and give people living in this area a voice and see what they have to say about oil exploration and about foreign companies coming together with the Ethiopian military to, to explore oil. Explain further, Martin, um, who the oil company was and its connection to the current foreign minister, Carl Bildt of Sweden. Well, there's Lundin Petroleum is, is the name of, of the big company, and they had a daughter company called Africa Oil, and uh, uh, Carl Bildt has on, been on the board of, of Lundin Petroleum, so, so that was uh, uh, the, the connection. At the time, 2011, when we went to do this story, he was not, no longer on the board. Uh, Why was he on the board of Lundin, of this oil company? Well, after... Um, his, his, uh, many people believe that he had left politics. He went into, into business and he became a, a board member. Uh, I think you have to ask him about that. It's a very special company and it's known for kind of being non-ethical. They did business with South Africa during apartheid. Uh, they were kicked out of Congo by, by the UN. Uh, they were doing business with Assad's Syria. So it's an oil company that goes to, to areas where no other oil companies uh, enters. So it's a very special company to, to be in the board of. Talk about what happened to you. So basically what, what Ethiopia did when they arrested me and Johan in the Ogaden region was to 
violate every international rule there is. Uh, they didn't take us to an embassy, they didn't give us medical care for our gun wounds. We were both shot uh, during the arrest. Uh, we were kept in the desert and instead they brought in some, some uh, Steven Spielberg figure who t turned out to be the vice president of the region who made a mockumentary about what happened when we were arrested. They brought in fake rebels who they gave guns and it was a total surreal uh, episode where we under gunpoint had to participate in, in the in the movie that was supposed to be shown on the Ethiopian state television and also used in court to, to sentence us for, for support of, of terrorism. Wait, let's go back a step. Yeah. <clears throat> Describe how you were arrested, how you were captured, how you came into the country and what happened next. Well, we entered into the region with a smuggler from Somalia and we met up with a, a guerrilla group that were supposed to be our guides and take us to the oil fields uh, so that we could interview civilians there. And the first days and nights when we walk in the Ugadan Desert are quite airy. We pass refugees who are fleeing on their way to the refugee camps in Kenya. We pass, we pass surrendered huts uh, where people have lived until recently. We pass people who have been subjected to torture from the Ethiopian military. And we feel that this is really, the conflict level here is very, very high. It's really a story to tell. And, uh, but after three days of walking, we are ambushed by the Ethiopian military. And we are immediately shot. I'm shot through the shoulder and the photographer is shot through his arm. So we have no other option but to raise our hands in, in the sky and shout media, media, international press. And, and then we are arrested. And at that point, we believe that we would be kicked out because that happened to New York Times when they were arrested in Vogadan. It has happened to several other journalists who have been arrested in this area. But uh, Ethiopia wants to, to make an example uh, and to scare off other foreign journalists from entering the region and also, and I think most importantly, send a message to their own journalists. Look what we can do to do to these two Swedish guys. Imagine what we can do to you. So they wanted to inflict fear in, in the Ethiopian uh, society. So then we are led through this uh, four or five uh, horrible days in the desert when they fabricate evidence against us under gunpoint and to make us cooperate they also arrange a mock execution which is arranged by the vice president in the region and he's a member of the Ethiopian parliament he arranges a mock execution where we are forced to to walk towards the horizon and there is a firing squad uh, behind us and I'm told to, to stop, to turn around and he says this is your last chance, admit that you are cooperating with the terrorists or you will be shot and then they fire in the bush uh, next to me and uh, from the sound I kind of fall down and then I get up and I brush the dust off and then a film camera comes up and another interrogation uh, takes place. So it was really a violation of all the, the legal protocols that, that you, could, uh, you could think of. Did you say what they wanted you to say? No, they wanted us to, uh, uh, to basically say that we were there to support the rebels. No, we never said that. We said that we are Swedish journalists and we are here to, to do our job. Uh, but just, just being there, just talking to, to this group was enough, according to the Ethiopian terrorism law, to, to sentence us. And it was very clear when we were brought to, to the federal police station uh, and we found out who was in, in the neighboring cell, who was in the cell to the, to the left or to the right and in front of us. It was no criminals. There were young journalists, uh, activists, bloggers, politicians, uh, different uh, community leaders. And, and then we, we really could feel that we had uh, ended up in something that was just bigger, that was much bigger than two Swedish journalists just violating uh, some visa. This group. mockumentary, as you call it, this yeah. fake documentary, um, uh, when they were filming you and yeah. said they would shoot you if you didn't say you were working with terrorists, yeah, did yeah. you then say, I am working with terrorists? No, no, no. You wouldn't say? No. So what did they do with this film? They made a long uh, uh, mockumentary about it and first of all they showed it in court and uh, they said that the people in, on this film uh, are the people that you walked with, which they were not. All the rebels we walked with ran away, so they were kind of fake rebels. And they also sentenced these fake rebels to 17 years in, in prison. So it was basically used as, as a fabricated evidence in, in court. Uh, and it was also used on the Ethiopian state television to, to kind of show, show Ethiopia that these were two Swedish terrorists who had entered their, their country to, to support terrorism. What happened to you in prison? 
I mean, the first the first month before we were uh, we were charged were the most difficult when we were kept in solitary confinement and we were interrogated and threatened with the death sentence or with life in prison and. Uh, it was kind of a, you had to, to win a battle uh, against yourself uh, every day and kind of take a teaspoon of, of cement every morning and, and just to try and think that, well, they, they may take my, my physical freedom, they may take my shoelaces, uh, even my shoes, my, my belt, uh, my pen and paper, but uh, there's one thing they can't take from me and that is to decide, I mean, who I am. And I am a journalist, so it's just another day at the office. I try to to, to, to live in that bubble and kind of, okay, how big is this cell? How would I describe this cell in, in, in my future writing? And, and try to start communicating with the other prisoners and try to, to never give up that, that core thing within you, who, who you are. They could never take that from you, even though you were handcuffed and in, in a dark room. So, so by thinking as a journalist, uh, I mean, I survived uh, mentally and, and was able to, to communicate with the other jail journalists, the local journalists, and, and they gave me a lot of strength and kind of explained what was going on in Ethiopia. We have to remember that this was also 2011. I mean, the Arabic Spring was, was raging in, in Egypt. In, uh, I mean, you had Tunisia, you had, you had Syria. Uh, Gaddafi hadn't fallen yet in, in Libya. And of course, a country which has 99.6% of the seats in the parliament, they would look to, to North Africa with fear and decided to rather act than being acted upon. So we ended up in a major crackdown against free speech. And, and all of the, the local Ethiopian journalists and politicians that were arrested at this time, they are still in jail. They are still in, in, in the prison. Hmm. Were you able to communicate with your cameraman? Yes. During the time you were in solitary? No, no. Uh, so you had no idea what was happening to him? No, and they tried to, of course, play us against uh, each other. You were both shot, we so were you were both, both dealing with your injuries. Yes, yes. Uh, we were denied also proper, proper medical care. Uh, we had a way to, to communicate after a while, and while knocking uh, on the door, uh, through a certain kind of Swedish way of knocking, we could what's I could understand that he was there and, and, and that he was alive. What's the Swedish way of knocking? I don't know, it was something like this. <laughs> and then he would answer in, in, in the same way and I would know that, whew, uh, you know, he's alive, uh, I, I'm, I'm not alone. The video that was made um, to falsely implicate you, mm. that was shown in Sweden as well? Yes. Uh, what was the response here? I think in the beginning, beginning it was a lot of confusion. Uh, I mean, journalists kind of quoted, they had this one hand on the other hand uh, perspective. So they would kind of see the Minister of Information in Ethiopia as a reliable source in the beginning. Uh, after a while, these things changed. And they definitely changed were when one of the people responsible of making this video, his name is Abdullah Hussein, he felt that this is wrong. Uh, Who was he working for? He was working for the, the president of the, of the region uh, mm -hmm. and for the vice president and he was head of the kind of the communications uh, department. He decided to, to become a whistleblower. So he took the original film from us in the desert together with a lot of other material uh, which shows atrocities, torture, uh, the Ethiopian military committing atrocities in the region. And uh, he left with risking his life, left everything and, and went to Kenya and managed to get in contact with a, a journalist at the Swedish television. So after our release, uh, the whole kind of material was shown. And in this, the whole, when the whole material was shown, you could see how, how everything was, was, was rigged. Can you talk, Martin, about when you learned you were going to be freed and what that release was like for you? We were called up in, uh, in the loudspeaker and, uh, uh, yeah, the, the Swedish ambassador was, was there to, uh, uh, to meet us and, and to take us out of, of prison and there was just one one hurdle left, and that was that Ethiopian state television wanted us to make an interview. Uh, the interview they didn't succeed in doing in the desert. And uh, basically we had, we could have said no to that and go back and, and take our 11 years and we wouldn't survive that. Or we would say to the 
Ethiopian uh, journalist that we, we apologize and, and accepted guilt and then we were they checked the interview with their information department and then we were uh, were released and and sent back to Sweden but I mean I'm so I'm, I'm free I'm free from from the prison but I'm not uh, I will never be free from from the memories I'm not free from the sounds it doesn't go a day that I don't think of of all the colleagues who are there uh, I mean I especially the sounds the screams uh, when people uh, kind of the first the first screams you really remember because those were always the worst and 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 then eventually the abuse prisoner was always silent but the first scream before the first stroke hit those, those screams you, you never forget and and those will will haunt me uh, for, for for the rest of my life and, and be a part of me but it also, I think also this experience makes me makes me better journalist. Uh, I mean, usually you go and you do a story, and then you go to a hotel and you take a beer, and and and, and that's that's it. Now, we went and, and we did a story which was supposed to be about oil, but it turned out to be about ink, about press freedom, and we slept on the concrete floor with in a prison with 8,000 inmates and, and we didn't go home the next day. We stayed and we stayed and we stayed and we stayed for 438 days and, and of course we were always somehow tourists in that environment. We had our embassy, we had our Swedish passports but, but still it, I went from just being a, uh, someone who's stand, standing and, and looking at something and also I was, I mean, participating in, in something and those, those experiences and, and really seeing the uh, the conditions of, of those prisoners and, and talking to them and, 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 uh, and sharing life stories with them that, that makes me a better journalist. And here at um, Almadalen we have passed the foreign minister Carl Bildt uh, several times just mm -hmm. walking down mm -hmm. the street. Um, since you were freed have you spent time with the foreign minister? I met him uh, briefly and we have been, uh, our message to him has been to learn the name of the jailed that are still in, in the Kaliti prison and to, to work for, for their release. I mean, especially Reut Aliyam, Awub Shetai, Eskindenega and, and many other colleagues who are, who are still there. We have been encouraging him to, to, raise, to raise that issue. And they were doing what as journalists? What were they investigating? Their crime is just writing about the reality. Uh, it's, it doesn't take an investigative report to get you in jail in Ethiopia. It just takes some criticism of, of the government. And uh, especially one of them, Riot Alemo, she's suffering from, uh, from cancer in one of her breasts in, in the prison. And uh, I remember one, at one point she, uh, uh, I was able to read a small note that, that she sent us and, and she wrote that her name was Riotta Lemo. Uh, she wrote why she became a journalist, that she wanted to write about the injustice in, she saw in, in Ethiopia and that that decision had led her to prison and, and she said that, please, please, uh, Martin, if, if you are released before me, tell the world I'm a journalist, I'm not a terrorist. And uh, I mean, doing, doing that uh, is kind of uh, the only way to, to live to live with this experience I mean to uh, to try and put the searchlight on that prison and on Ethiopia and on the colleagues that that are still that are still there and still suffering just for doing their job I mean their only their only crime is courage uh, and uh, I'm, I'm proud that there are such colleagues in, in the world who's prepared to pay the, the highest price for this for this profession Swedish journalist Martin Chibier, he and Johan Persson wrote about their jailing in Ethiopia. In the book titled 438 Days, How Our Quest to Expose the Dirty Oil Business in the Horn of Africa Got Us Tortured, Sentenced as Terrorists, and Put Away in Ethiopia's Most Famous Prison. I interviewed Martin last year in Sweden. Earlier this month, Riyat Alemu, the Ethiopian journalist Shabir mentioned during the interview, was released from prison after four years in jail on terrorism charges. In an interview with The New York Times, she said about the Ethiopian government, quote, they just want to pretend in front of Obama and the international community that they're democratic and trying to improve human rights conditions. Special thanks to Sandra Lazare and John Hamilton. This is Democracy Now! When we come back, the ousted president of Honduras, Manuel Zelaya, stay with us.